Okay. Let me just. All right. So, and the reason I say that is because uh, uh, field theory is really is really a lot. I mean, it's really really uh, it's 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 intense. So I don't want you to take so much time out of your high school schedules. Uh, if if it's not something you should, and then on the flip side, if you are going, if if I think you you should do research and you're ready and you're planning, you should really be taking field theory seriously, right? So there's there's two sides to that. You should really really be asking questions, learning, doing the problem because it's super important. You you have a good foundation. If you don't have, as you guys know, you guys have been in high school for a long time. Some of you in college who are are have been in contact with me you need a good foundation. It's, it's very hard to like jump. If, if I gave you a test in Japanese today, it would be pretty difficult, right? So it's the same thing with math and, and science. It's like learning a language. Okay, anyways. Okay, what are we doing today? We're learning about scattering. So scattering is a very important topic. So between last week, the hydrogen atom, and this week, scattering, I would say these two classes actually let me, let me change my, my, my analysis. So all the classes up until the hydrogen atom were prep, okay? The hydrogen atom was our first real calculation. And for those of you that stuck with me last week, we got through it, we pounded through it. It was, it, it was tough, it was tough, but we got through it and we got the energy values for the hydrogen atom. Okay, good. From the hydrogen atom until the end of the class, all the skills you're going to learn are super important. I mean, I'm just, I, I mean, these are the kinds of skills we use all the time. So, so, and so it's important to stop me if you're confused, if you have questions, if something's not clear, it's okay, it's good. Uh, I can spend two weeks on scattering. I don't have to do all 15 pages of my notes rapid fire. I'm okay with taking an extra day on scattering if we need it. Uh, that's why I was going fast. So what is scattering? So. I guess what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe this to you in sort of a foreshadowing way. Okay, I'm going to kind of tell you where we're going and why we're doing it this way. So in quantum field theory, one of the really important things we're trying to describe are scattering, scatterings between particles, interactions between particles. So let's say you have two particles coming in and two particles bouncing off each other, okay? How would you describe this process? This, this is one of the big questions in quantum field theory, okay? And these little diagrams tell us how to solve for scattering, how to write down all of the mathematics of scattering. And these little diagrams are called Feynman diagrams. Okay. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about a Feynman diagram, okay? And they're very, very popular, very, very famous. And what is it that you're computing in quantum field theory? You're computing this thing called a scattering amplitude, okay, which is this script M. Now, why do I call it scattering amplitude? We know from quantum mechanics that there's no such thing as uh, absolute positions or absolute momentums. Therefore, there's no such thing as absolute scatterings. The best I can tell you is before I do the actual scattering experiment, the best I can say to you is this. I can say there's a variety of different scattering possibilities the particles could have, right? Each one of those scattering possibilities has a probability, right? And each one of those probabilities contributes to the scattering amplitude. So the scattering amplitude is the direct analog of the probability amplitude. Okay, so this is in field theory. And this, we're gonna spend a lot of time computing these kinds of things uh, using some mathematical machinery. Fine. Now, where did Feynman get his idea for this? Well, he gets his idea from observing how we talk about scattering in quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, we talk about scattering and we compute scattering amplitudes. The only difference is we cannot 
compute these amplitudes in high energy situations. That's where you need quantum field theory. So today we're going to learn about scattering in quantum mechanics. And we're going to write down some scattering amplitudes. And we're going to draw some diagrams and write down the series, OK? Uh, so let's do it. So, so this, is, this is another one of those sort of uh, important steps, important precursory steps to understanding where Feynman diagrams come from, which is a huge part of learning quantum field theory. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of sophistication in the field theory aspect that we're going to uh, zoom over for now. OK, so what is scattering? Let, let's, let's describe scattering. So you have a, part or a particle coming in, right? So there's some incoming quantum mechanical particle, and it's scattering off some center point. So I throw the particle in, and it bounces off. OK. So who did the most famous scattering experiment? Our buddy Rutherford, right? He did the most famous scattering experiment. Does anyone want to describe what Rutherford did? I know you all know his experiment, so. Rika, do you remember what Rutherford did? Was it the gold foil experiment? Yeah, exactly. So do you want to describe what he found out? Uh, I don't remember the specifics, but he had like, he fired electrons mm -hmm. to and then he found that there was a center of positive charge. Right, exactly. So he discovered that there was a proton by scattering these electrons off of atoms, right? Yeah. And he found out that there was a positive center because they were hitting some hard center and ricocheting off. So these are the kinds of experiments that uh, uh, people do to, to see what are the most fundamental constituents of matter. Okay. So the particle comes in with an energy E, okay? It has some impact parameter. Impact parameter is just some constant that tells us how strong the impact was, how strong the force was. We call that little b. And there's some scattering angle, theta, by which it scatters at. So we can draw a picture at this, of this. Particle comes in. Okay, there's some angle theta that it scatters off at. Make that a solid line. Okay, and there's some impact parameter. So here's my particle and it ricochets off. Okay, and this is the scattering center. Okay. So in classical scattering theory, so first let's talk about scattering classically. Let's just say I throw some particle in and it scatters off at some angle. My goal is to compute theta. I want to know at what angle it scatters off at, right? That's going to tell me all of the physics of the system. Because I'm, I'm going to know B. B is predetermined by how hard I'm firing it, all of those kinds of things. What weight is the particle? What size? What strength? And as long as I know theta, I kind of know about the dynamics of what happened. OK? So the smaller the B, the smaller my impact parameter, the larger th uh, theta is. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's just the way these impact parameters work. Don't worry so much about that. Let's just, let's just solve for some of this stuff. OK. So the particle comes in. It comes in. And there's a little bit of, there's, a, there's an area here. There's an area drawn out by the hard center that it's scattering, right? So the area, or the cross-sectional area, of, 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 of the center, this big center of mass thing that this particle's uh, hitting, we call sigma. So this is the cross-sectional area. And we always write it as an infinitesimal element, d sigma. Okay. And, and of course, you cal uh, your calculus instinct should be, should, be, uh, should be going up right now. You can say, OK, this is something we can integrate over. right? We can integrate over this area. And, and, and that will tell us something about theta and tell us something about the dynamics. OK, and then the, the, the angle that it is uh, scattering off of, we call the solid angle omega. So this is another parameter. So we really have two things we need to look at, the cross-sectional area and the solid angle it's scattering off of, d omega. OK. And this little thing. 
d of theta equals d sigma over d omega, we call the proportionality factor. So this is sort of the, the number we want that's going to tell us about scattering, the ratio between the two. Okay, and then we have a differential cross section, which is just equal to d of theta over d omega, which makes sense, right? Because this is an area. So this is going to give us the area of the total area over which it's scattering, right? The total area of the scattering incident. So let's say you had some hard sphere, right? I have some hard ball and I fire an electron at it and it scatters off at some angle. Okay, there's some area over which it's scattered off of, right? And so that's what this is gonna tell me. Okay, let's, let's, let's draw it out. I drew a lot of pictures, that's why I have my notes. I don't usually draw pictures, but I drew pictures because for scattering, it's nice to see some pictures. So let me show you what all of this means now. Okay, I have a particle and it's gonna be fired off somewhere. Okay, it's hitting off of some uh, hard sphere, right? And it's ricocheting off, okay? It's passing through some area, d sigma, right? So this is just some total area as it sweeps across. And then the angle it makes as it scatters off is d omega. Okay. And then of course the impact parameter is defined b. Does this picture make it a little more clear? I hope so, I'm not a, I'm not a good artist. Okay, so we can write out now some integration measures. Uh, do, let, me just, let me just ask a question. Does everyone know what I mean when I say integration measure? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That, that's why I'm asking. Stop me. Stop me. Say, Kyle, what do you mean by that? I've never, I, I don't really know what you're talking about. That's fine. That's good. Tell me when you don't know what I'm talking about. That's very good. Okay, Jenna, let's talk about that then. I think I did the same thing with Mansoura. I showed Mansoura a limit last time. I said, Mansoura, do you know what a limit is? He goes, no. And I just showed him this whole limit. I said, tell me, tell me. Okay, so you know what an integral is, right? Okay, good. So let's say I'm integrating some function, right? Could be any, any, any damn thing. And then I have dx, right? That, that's what you usually see. This is my integration measure. That's, that's all I mean. It's, it's, so I could have a dy, I could have a dz, right? I could have all sorts of differentials here. And all this is telling me, this is mathematical language speak for, these are the things I'm integrating over, right? A better way to think about it are these are the dimensions of my problem, right? These are the free parameters that could change. Uh, an even better way to think about it is these are my degrees of freedom. That's what we say in physics terms, okay? So now I need some integration measures for scattering. So just like last week for the hydrogen atom, I wrote some integration measures for spherical coordinates. So let's write them down. So d sigma, equals b db d omega. So these are just integration measures, nothing, nothing crazy. And d omega equals sine theta d theta d phi, which you should recognize from spherical coordinates. Nothing fancy there. If, if this is confusing, just watch last lecture. We went over where these come from uh, pretty in depth. Okay, and then the total cross section then is that, of course, then it's just the integral over d of theta. Okay, so, so now we're starting to get to total values, right? If we integrate over that space, we get a total cross section. That's all. Okay, so this, this, is, this is classical scattering. I told you nothing about probabilities. So now suppose we have a beam of particles, right? Like in the Rutherford experiment that Rika described to us. Then we can define a term called the luminosity. And the luminosity is the number of incident particles. Per 
per unit area. Okay. This is, of course, classical. So, you know, in Rutherford scattering, Rutherford scattering, guys, was a classical thing. It wasn't really, he was looking at a beam, he was looking at a collection of particles. Uh, there wasn't sort of these weird quantum effects coming about, or at least he couldn't really tell. Okay, so then we can define this differential, d capital N, as equal to L d sigma equals L d theta d omega. And this capital N is just the number of particles. So this is sometimes referred to as the number operator, which we'll see. I mean, this is, this is trivial. Don't worry so much about that. I just wanted to show you another equation that you're going to see a lot. Okay, and it follows from this that d of theta equals 1 over capital uh, L d n d omega. Okay. So these are just some really basic scattering uh, classical scattering equations. Nothing, nothing fancy and uh, you can sit down and work through some of this stuff, make up some problems. Any questions? I mean, this is not so important because this is a quantum mechanics class. So you can always go into a Taylor, John Taylor's textbook and see this stuff. Fine. Do we at least get the basic intuitive picture of what's going on? By the way, uh, Jenna, unfortunately, you're the only one with your camera on. So when I ask a question, I'm relying on you. Okay, Liz, Lizzie's joined in too. Okay, because I, li I like to see some head shakes. So, so I was gonna say Jenna's the representative of the class then, whether you guys get something or not, but that's okay. Does this intuitive picture make sense? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay, we have thumbs ups coming in. Oh my God, the digital world has overtaken us. Okay. Okay, let's talk about quantum mechanics now. Okay, which is which is what we're here for. So first of all, we need to redefine what we mean by particle, right? We can't talk about just some some particle flying through space. Now the particle is going to have a wave function, right? And instead of the particle being some object going through space, like a ball or, or, or an electron, it's going to be a wave propagating through space, right? It's going to be a wave moving through space, like a sound wave, like any kind of wave. It's going to be moving through space. Okay, so we imagine plane waves moving through space. So now our particle has a wave function, and we'll just write it as e to the i k z, which is a plane wave moving in the z direction. Okay, do we, do we know what plane waves are? If you plot this in Desmos, you'll see literally lines, like vertical lines. That's what a plane wave is. It's just vertical lines through space, right? There's no wiggly motion. There's no oscillatory motion. That's what I mean by plane waves. Okay. Okay, and so this is the incident wave, right? It's coming in on the scattering target. Okay, and we have solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So these are the solutions, which should look familiar. By the way, this is in spherical coordinates, which is what we talked about last time. You have some constant, and we're going to break this down. Plus some f of theta, which I'll describe what this is pretty soon. E to the i k r over r. OK, I'll describe what this is. But I mean, this kind of stuff should look familiar as solutions. So the plane waves are coming in. Let's draw a picture of what's going on here, quantum mechanically. So this is our coordinate system, right? The plane waves are coming in. And they're moving through space in the z direction, we'll call it. Right, so I have plane wave, plane wave, plane wave, and they're just coming in. They're hitting off of some target, right? And when they hit off this target, more waves come off the target, right? Because now we have two particles. And the waves coming off the target are spherical waves, kind of protruding outwards. 
right? And they have some wave function that goes e to the i k r. This is parameterized by its radius. And of course, we know what k is. k is just 2 m e over h bar, right? Our, our famous uh, multiplier, OK? So this is what would happen in the quantum mechanical situation. And of course, they're going to be parameterized by some angle theta. OK, so now the quantum mechanical picture, I should make these straight lines so we can see them more clearly. Is this kind of making a little sense how it's different from the classical picture? It's a little abstract, but uh, very practical. Very, very, uh, I got to tell you, the stuff we're going to be computing today is very practical. You need this stuff if you want to start your own laboratory in your bedroom. You're going to need to know this because these are the kinds of things you're going to see. You want to, you're going to see what angle it comes off at, right? Okay, so let's, let's keep going then. So the whole problem, the whole thing we're going to try to do is try to get this f of theta. This is the whole problem. And this f of theta is the direct analog to script m, okay, in field theory. f of theta is the scattering amplitude. Scattering amplitude. Okay, so this is, this is the whole thing we need to get. Uh, you can think of it this way. This, this process going on here could have a variety of different forms, right? The plane waves could come from this way. They could come from this way. They could come here and go up and go down. And, I mean, there's, we're dealing with probabilities, right? So every path is possible, but the most likely path is if the plane wave just comes straight on, okay? So this is the process that's going to be most likely to happen. Therefore, it's going to be the biggest contribution to the scattering amplitude. Okay, but really the scattering amplitude is the sum of all the different processes that could happen. Okay, this is a very abstract idea, but it's, it's actually this kind of idea is going to be super important when we do the path integral. Does someone have a conceptual question about that? Let's just make sure we really know, because in my head, it's totally clear. But obviously, when it's clear in your head, it's probably not clear when you speak it out loud because we all store information differently. So does, is, is that conceptually clear? Um, for me, that, that makes sense conceptually, but I just have a question. Um, yeah. So what does theta represent, uh, I guess, there? Um, Here? Yeah, yeah. Could you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so this is literally the angle at which it's scattering off of. Oh, okay, okay. Literally, it's literally an angle, yeah. It could be a number, it could be a long fraction with an angle, and it's just some kind of angle, literally. Now, I know that sounds weird in this context with waves, uh, but, but it, it is literally some measure of an angle. Okay, so let's, let's figure out what these f of thetas are, okay? Let's, let's do some. So this tells us the probability of scattering in a given direction theta. So that was kind of the idea except of adding these, these processes together. Okay, so let's write down some objects. So we have our probability, D, D capital P, right? Which we know, uh, we've done this so many times, it's psi squared, but instead in scattering, we're gonna have a psi incident. So this is the incident part, right? The incident waves that are coming in, right? Psi squared dB over that volume. Right? And then we have another probability dp, which is equal to psi scattered. Squared dv. Okay, and again, we have d sigma, which is equal to f squared d omega, right? And we have our d of theta which again is our differential cross-section. Square, okay. So these are just coming from our, I spelled scattered wrong, but it's okay, I trust you guys. This is just coming from our, uh, our usual 
wave function probability stuff, the norm squared is equal to the, the total probability and so on. Nothing, nothing fancy. Okay. So let's, let's, let's get to computing them. Let's see how we actually find these things. This is all just very, it's, it's just formulas, no, nothing fancy yet. Okay, I'm gonna erase. Okay. So there are really two methods to compute f of theta. Okay, there, there are two big methods. The first method is called a partial wave analysis. I'm not going to do that one because I, for my per, for our purposes, I don't think it's so enlightening. And plus, when you take, if if you take this in college or in graduate school, you'll do a partial wave analysis. So I'm not going to I'm not going to bother you with that. It's very it's very long and winded. The other method is called a Born approximation, and this was uh, founded by a guy named, I think his first name was Max, it might be Max Born, or I, I don't remember his first name, but it's Born, you should all know who that is. <laughs> okay, and uh, that's what we're going to do, we're going to do a Born approximation. Just to give you an idea of the partial wave analysis, which I did do out, uh, it's, it's very annoying, so we're not, we're not going to bother. Here we go. Okay. And in this method, you are going to learn a lot of useful mathematics. So get ready for some nice mathematics that you're going to be using a lot in your college careers, especially those of you that want to go into STEM. So, so this is really practically useful too, from a, from a mathematical standpoint. Okay, so let's start with our time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, we have that. And I'm going to write my time independent Schrodinger equation in a very suggestive form. So I'm going to recast this as this alpha squared plus k squared psi squared equals q. You might be like, what is he doing? You'll, you'll find out. Okay, here k is just our usual wave number, our usual uh, famous uh, thing. And a Q is some constant, not constant, but uh, it's just equal to this. Okay, so I've sort of recast the Schrodinger equation in a way that's going to help us. And the Schrodinger equation in this form is called the Helmholtz, if you want to look it up. Yeah, it's called, I didn't even know it had a name. Just goes to show you, I, uh, I thought I derived this on my own, and then I looked up the exact constants, and this guy Helmholtz put it into this form like 70 years ago, so <laughs> I'm behind. <laughs> okay, so note that Q depends on psi. Okay, just note that. That, that, that's important. It's not just a constant, okay. So, suppose we could find a function, G of R, okay, that could solve this equation, right, with a delta function. Okay, what do I mean by that mathematically? So let's say we have some solution to this equation, right, that goes g of r, right, and the solution comes in the form of a delta function. Okay, that, that's, that's what I'm positing. Of course, as you guys know, there are many, many solutions to this equation. It's not just plain waves, and this is just a differential equation that you can solve many, many ways. Okay, so I want a solution in this form. Okay. Okay, so let's see what I can do with this thing. Uh, I know this seems a little contrived, but it is, right? When you have some kind of equation and you want to get information out of it, you construct a solution. So I've constructed a solution. We all know what this is, right? This is just a Dirac delta function. And what, it, what does a Dirac delta function do for you? It helps you define things at a point, right? It gets you to one point. Uh, or it tells you that all the action is at a certain point, okay? Which could be useful in scattering. You'll see why. And, but I haven't told you what this G of R thing is yet, okay? So let's further define the wave function. So let's say I want to define the wave function as this thing. 
Okay, so I'm telling you now, I'll, I'll explain in a second. So integral over space. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you furthermore, remember, this function is a wave function, right? It has to have something to do with psi because it's taking the spot of this, right? And what am I telling you now? I'm telling you that psi is dependent on r, okay? And this g of r is, is, is really a function of r minus some initial point r naught. So it's kind of behaving like a wave, uh, like a delta function. Okay, so let, let, let's keep going with it. And of course, I'm integrating over all space. Okay, and I'm just going to rewrite my integration measure. So d3r naught is equal to this thing. Wait a second, let me make sure I did this right. Delta 2, g of r naught. Yeah, that's not so important. Uh, that's a little overkill. We'll, we'll leave that out. But anyways, I'm telling you that this sort of behaves like a delta function. Okay, so this, this function is called the Green's function. And I'll tell you why it's so important in scattering. Okay, so in scattering, let's think of this intuitively before we get heavy with the math. In scattering, let's say you have a coordinate system. You have a bunch of points, right? Just a bunch of points, x, x1, x2, x3. Your incident waves are coming in, and they're scattering at another point. Let's say they scatter at x5, OK? So intuitively, let's think about this. All of the action is happening at a single point, right, in space. All of the action is happening at x5. Therefore, I only care about my process at one point in the function, OK? And abstractly, it's a little, you should read about this more. But really, that's what this is trying to convey to me. That's what this Green's function, the Green's function is also referred to as a source function. Why? Because it's r minus r naught. This is a function of one point, right? And it's going to be doing something at that one point. Now, what happens to a Dirac delta function at r minus r naught? It contributes something. It gives me a 1, right? If, if r and r naught are not equal, then this term is just 0, which, is, which makes sense in scattering, right? Because if I'm talking about a scattering process at two different points, what is the scattering amplitude going to be? 0, because nothing's scattered yet, right? They're still going through space. The scattering happens at one instant in time, OK? Does anyone have questions about that? OK, it's abstract, but uh, that's really why this Green's function is popping up. That's why you see Dirac delta function. That's why, that's why you see these things popping up. It's just to reinforce that we're looking at one point. We're going to strictly define that point. Then we're going to compute all of the dynamics at that one point. And this Green's function is going to have some form. Could be plane waves. It could, it could, it's going to be something to tell us about the scattering. OK. So let's define a Green's function. So let's let g of r, a Green's function, equal this. So this is a normalization, right, which uh, is a little trivial. e to the i s dot r, I'll tell you what s is, g of s d3s. OK, don't worry about what the S is right this second. OK, and of course, we can plug it back into my Helmholtz equation, right? Because I'm saying that this G of R needs to solve this equation, OK? So this is important. Before, we were saying that wave functions solve the Schrodinger equation, right? And give me the dynamics, right? Now we're saying in scattering, Green's functions solve the Schrodinger equation, OK? And the Green's function in scattering defines a process at a particular point, OK? Fine. OK, so let's just plug this thing in into Helmholtz.
Another novel? No, no, I'm fine. I'm to the part. Oh. Invest. D3S. Okay, so I've just plugged that in into my Helmholtz equation. Nothing, nothing fancy there. Okay. Uh, let me make sure I did this right. Right, exactly, exactly. What did I label as double star? And now let's carry out the derivatives. Okay, let's just rewrite this with, with my derivatives. Which I will use my, fa my uh, famous uh, chain rule. So of course, I'm going to have factors of S, factors of K coming down. The K is still, still there. I'll just have factors of S. You write this in this. And I can re, I can, uh, yeah, I can rewrite G of S as the following. A squared minus S squared. Okay. Can you read that or should I rewrite it? I'll rewrite it up top because we're going to do this integral. Nothing too, just some simple manipulations there. So I'm just going to rewrite this. So I have a one over two pi to the three halves integral minus S squared plus k squared e to the i s dot r g of s d three s okay g of s two pi three halves k squared minus s squared okay so I've just sort of done some manipulations. You can uh, do that uh, if you'd like and sit through it. I can erase all of this. Yeah. Okay, fine. So now I have some some uh, some weird form for uh, for g of r, right? This is my Green's function. Let's not lose track. So I'm going to plug this back into, uh, I think, Helmholtz. Well, no, I've redefined G of S. So let me replug that into my Green's function. So now my Green's function becomes, actually, let me, this is, this is the main thing we're going to need. Don't worry about my manipulations, but uh, just know that the Green's function ends up looking like this. after what we just did. And now I'm going to define uh, S to you. Okay, so that's my Green's function. And I just plugged in that little G of S. Don't worry about that little, little stuff. I can explain that in depth tomorrow if you'd like. Okay, now, <laughs> do any of you know how to do this kind of integral? Okay, this is, this is a nasty integral. It looks so innocent, right? It looks so innocent and so, so nice and simple. It's really not. So let's talk about how we can do this. Okay, but let's, let's take a pause first. Uh, we haven't done anything too extreme, right? We've rewrote the Schrodinger equation. I've redefined a solution, g of r, and I've called that solution a Green's function. Okay, the Green's function takes on this form. Okay, I hope this isn't too, you're not lost right now. Too much. Okay, fine. Okay, so let's look at our coordinate system. Okay. 
<laughs> I even wrote on this paper, this integral is not so simple. Oh no, that's not good. <laughs> okay, let's let, 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 let's just define the coordinate system we're in. So we're gonna be in spherical coordinates and I'm, I'm doing this as a review for those of you that weren't here last time. So I have three dimensions. I have three degrees of freedom, phi. Uh, I have a vector, S. So now S is my vector, okay, in the coordinate system. I have theta and I have R. And I'll tell you what these degrees of freedom are, okay? And then of course, as you all know, I can project the components of that vector, okay? Okay. You've seen something like this drawn in your calc class, right? With like projection vectors and unit vectors. Okay, good. Okay, fun. What is theta? What is phi? What is r? So let's think of a sphere, okay? We have a radius, right? That's one direction we can go in. And then we have two angles. We have the angle going this way, right? Up and down. Actually, you know what? Here, this is just perfect. So on my bookshelf, guess what I have? I have a globe, beautiful. I mean, it doesn't get better than this. Okay, so let's look at this sphere and let's define all of the, the degrees of freedom. So we have a radius, right? So if I start here, I have some radius, right? On the sphere. I have a polar angle going up and down, right? That's theta and it's moving all the way around. And then I have another angle going around this way, right? We'll call that phi. Okay, I'll do it again. That globe is not very, not very useful. So the equator, the line going this way, makes an angle. We'll call that phi. Okay. The the what are the lines going this way? Longitude, right? <laughs> Take me back to ninth grade. Ad hoc. These are longitude. Those are my polar angles, theta, and then I have a radius. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, I, and don't get confused actually, because mathematicians flip-flop these. So they call the polar angle phi and, and the angle going around theta. Uh, so you'll get very confused and you'll blame me. I told you. Okay, so let's write down some stuff we looked at last, last time with spherical coordinates. Where's my chalk, okay. Okay, so we have our integration measure. If we have S dotted with R in this coordinate system, we get SR cosine beta by some angle. Okay, if I wanna do this integral now, it's gonna be over three components, R, theta, and phi. Okay, so let's do the theta integral. Uh, the, the, let, me, let me just make sure. So the theta integral goes from zero to pi, e to the i s r cosine theta, right? This is just my dot product plugged in, sine theta d theta, my integration measure for theta, right? Why is my, why are my bounds in the theta direction from zero to pi? Why aren't they from zero to two pi? So, Actually, this is, this is something that actually really confused me when I was learning it in calculus in college. And I'm like, why are, why are we, because right, two pi is usually a whole period, right? Right? It turns out that zero to two pi in the polar direction would take you around the sphere twice. Okay, you only have to go from zero to pi. Okay, don't, I, I'm still not quite sure why. I really have to actually, it, it's, it should be pretty obvious if you think about it for a second but you actually will go around twice if you go from zero to two pi. Anyways, save that for your calc professor. Okay, and if I do this integral, this integral is not so hard. I get minus e to the i sr cosine theta over i sr from zero to pi, okay? And then this is just equal to two sine sr over sr. So now I can rewrite my Green's function. Uh, by the way, I, you wanna, uh, I'll give you a good hint. Let's say you saw this integral and you got really like, I don't know what he did there, or if I do any integral. Go on Wolfram Alpha, 
or Mathematica and plug it in and see how they solve it, right? And that's how you learn how to do integrals. That's how I learn. Every time I'd see a tough integral, and then I, I had a little notebook. I still have it somewhere in my papers. Every time I had a tough integral, I'd write it down and I'd write down the steps. And that's how I learn integrals. You don't really learn how to do nice integrals in calculus. They, 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 they leave the easy stuff there, so. Okay, so now my Green's function can be rewritten even further. This is the integral in the S direction or the R direction. We still haven't done that one. The S, right? So Remember, I told you we have to do three integrals. We have to do phi, theta, and r. There's three dimensions we need to integrate over. So I could have written this down as one big expression with three integrals, right? Like a triple integral. But I'm breaking it down, doing it a little slower. Okay? This equals 1 over 4 pi squared r. I did a change of variable, or not a change of variables. I just uh, changed my bounds here. Window. You know, with the fall, it's very annoying. It's cold in the morning and then it gets hot like an hour later. Okay, so I've changed my bounds. And now we have to deal with this. So I've ignored it. But now we have to deal with this. Okay, so let's let's talk about how we're going to integrate this. Okay. Can I erase all of this? Are we okay? Okay. Actually, I'm pretty sure Townsend has a really nice explanation. I haven't looked in Townsend, so I would look at Townsend if you're a little confused. Okay, now the question. This is, this is uh, what we have to integrate. Uh, this is going to be a little tricky, uh, but uh, the first thing we need to do is I'm going to write this in a kind of nicer form, an exponential form, and I'm going to factor this denominator, okay? So what do I mean by that? I'm going to have to rewrite this. And since I'm going to factor the denominator, I'm going to get two integrals. Okay, so I just factored the denominator and I changed this sign into exponentials, right? You know that sine and sines and cosines can be written as e exponentials. Yes, and they're you subtract two of them. It's like e to the i kx minus e to the i kx equals sine kx, something like that. There's some weird identity. Okay, and I'm going to rewrite this in a simpler way, uh, just with my little factor. I1 minus I2, two integrals we need to do. I see we lost people, that's not a good sign. <laughs> okay, so let's break this down. So here we go, this is your first big math formula, folks. Get ready. So the way we evaluate, so now we need to evaluate this first integral and the second integral. 
Uh, this is a little difficult to do. Okay, and the way we're going to evaluate these formulas is using Cauchy's formula or Cauchy's theorem, which goes like this. So it's this weird integral sign, which I'll explain. You have this form f of z, z minus z naught dz. You get 2 pi i f of z naught. So this is Cauchy's theorem. Okay, let's let's break this down. Why did I draw the little line, a uh, little circle around the integral? So first of all, this function actually makes a closed loop in the complex plane. Okay, so you're integrating over some, let's say I had some complex plane, right? So I have the reals here and I have the imaginary parts here, right? I can have any closed loop, right? any closed surface. So if you put this into some complex plane grapher, you'll find that this makes really a semicircle along the complex plane, okay? And so Cauchy's theorem tells you how to integrate a complex function that's closed. And uh, don't ask me how you get this, you'll have to ask a mathematician. It's very complicated. No one remembers the proof. It's just like something you see the proof once and then you cry and then you forget about it. And then you just use the formula. So we see we kind of have that form here. Uh, except there's a problem. There's a problem. So let's talk about the problem. So S is my radius or my, my, my distance or my vector, right? So that's what I integrated over. What I'm integrating over. But k is just some random fixed point. Okay, here's the problem though. Let's just look at this for a second. Let me, let me break this down. S e to the minus s r. Actually, I'll, I'll even make this simpler. Let's break this down a little bit. We have something in the numerator, doesn't matter. And we have this denominator. Okay, and then in the plane, we have a closed contour, like a semicircle. Okay, and you know, these are all the s, uh, these are all the different values it could take of my function. And now I'm integrating over this. Okay, but here's the problem what happens in the denominator as we approach minus k? Or as we approach, yeah, as we approach, as we approach k in general k or minus k, plus or minus k in the denominator. Well, this thing goes to zero, right? This is gonna become zero. Okay, let's, let's break that down. So if this is equal to plus k, wait, let's think about this for a second. Hold on. I have a value for s. Oh, okay, let me be more precise, sorry. That doesn't make a lot of sense. If k equals s, how about that? If k equals s, then we have a problem in the denominator, right? And then in this case, if minus k equals s, right? So that's where we get the problem of plus and minus k. I, sorry, I just threw a plus and minus k at you and I didn't tell you what I meant. So if these two things are equal, this denominator is undefined. We have a big problem. That's why we have to be very careful in this integral. Okay, the places where this, this contour is undefined, we call those poles, okay? And I, you should really read about this in your own time. This is a huge topic called, and actually in the problems that I assigned for you this week, you get a lot of, I really guide you through it. So, uh, so, so don't worry. But, but the places where it's undefined, we call those poles. And you know, the pole could be here, the pole could be here, wherever they're equal, there's a pole, right? Wherever they're equal. Uh, and uh, we have to avoid them, right? Because if you hit the pole, your integral is undefined. We call that undefined point a singularity. And so now I'm gonna use jargon. I hate jargon, but I'll use it because it's easier here. If you hit the pole in a complex integral, you hit the singularity, okay? That, that makes it all nice and easy. 
So we have to find a way to avoid the pole. And what do we do? We do this process called skirting the pole. Oh my God, this is, I don't know why people made up all these terms, very annoying. So we have to skirt the poles, okay? So let's do that. Let's do this integral over the contour using Calchi's formula while also skirting the poles, okay? Yes, we have to skirt the poles, good. Okay, so let's draw a more precise image. So I have the real part of S, right? And I have the imaginary part of S. Uh, can I ask you guys a question? Those of you that are, who, who's in Calc BC right now? Are any of you in Calc BC right now? Okay, 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 fine. Did you guys, have any of you taken a calculus class before? Yeah. Yeah, I took um, uh, Calc B, oh, I basically took Calc BC last year. Okay, okay, good. And Jenna, okay. Okay, Jenna, I would recommend, uh, before we do field theory, uh, you should do the, do you guys know a good book that you like? We can talk about it after, but if there's a good book, think about it for Jenna. We can help her get up to speed with the calculus. Oh, I know one really quickly. Um, the Princeton Review is really good in general. Like yes. study the Calc BC, like the AP books, they're really nice. Okay, okay. That, so. Yeah, so you know, it, it, it's good to learn some, some calculus on your own, which is okay, it's okay, it's not a big deal. Okay, now this stuff, no one's seen in, 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 in Calc class. You'll have to take, uh, I'm just, I'm showing you this stuff very, very scandalously. Like you have to take a whole math class on, the, on these integrals, which I did. So don't worry if it's a little bit weird, it's going to be, you need to spend time with it. Anyway, so we have our real part of S, we have all I need you to do for our purposes is know what you get when you have that integral. That's it, I mean, okay, so let's see. So I have my pole, okay? This is S equals minus K. This is X equals K, okay? There we go. Now this, this see, this is why I drew pictures. It makes it so easy now, <laughs> rather than me trying to explain it to you. So what am I gonna do? I have my closed contour and I'm going to skirt it. I'm gonna go over the pole or I could go under the pole. as I come around the semicircle. Okay, so I have to skirt them. I have to go around or I have to give the function a push in one direction or the other to make sure it misses this point, okay? Okay, very good. So S has a large positive imaginary part close above and close the singularity. Okay, right. So, and this is the sort of formula, okay? Imagery, the imagery behind it. So now I can rewrite I1 in the following way, just taking into account all that stuff. It's a closed integral. Okay, ds. I can use Cauchy's theorem here. And I can evaluate the integral. If this prop procedure, if I, if this procedure for I1 giving you this is odd, look up how to do this kind of contour integral. It's not hard. It's, re it's really not that bad. Okay. And let's do I2. Let's evaluate I2. I'll leave Cauchy's theorem up there and I'll do I2 up here. I'll write out all my steps. 
just so if you look it up, you can see what I'm doing. Uh, you're just going to get the opposite for I2 at the two poles. Okay. So I've evaluated the two integrals and I can plug that back in to my Green's function. Okay. If you don't know how I did that, just know that that's the answer. And trust me, this should not even be in there. What time is it? Wow, 39. Ooh. Crazy. We have so much stuff. Uh, okay, we can take a five minute break to 45 and then I'll be able to finish up in 20 minutes then Gabe will come in. I mean, all we're doing here, nothing complicated. All we've done here is we've rewritten the Green's function and we've evaluated the integrals, that's it. And we just need to be careful because of these singularities, okay? It's so interesting because quantum mechanics is so mathematical. There's so little physical intuition. And uh, eventually I'll have to show you guys some general relativity if you end up doing research. General relativity is so much more clear. So much, you can solve everything on your own. You don't need to think a lot. It's so much simpler, geometric, beautiful, in my opinion than quantum mechanics, which is very like nasty to deal with. And field theory is even worse. You have to like really, really think before you do a calculation. Okay, you get a little brain break. Oh, uh, in the break, I'll mention Nobel Prize in Physics was announced uh, uh, to Roger Penrose. And uh, two, uh, you see, I don't even know the experimenters. That's so bad. I only know the theorists. Andrea Gels, I think. Gels, I think. Yeah, and there was one yeah. who's the other guy. Yeah, Reinhard Genzel. Reinhard, Reinhard Genzel, right. Wenzel Genzel, I don't even know. Uh, tomorrow, those of you that come, I think I'm gonna give a little mini brief on what they did and more of the specifics. Uh, but Roger Penrose is, uh, I met him uh, last year. Very, very uh, interesting thinker. Very mathematical physicist actually. So kind of interesting that he won it. And man, that experiment that they did incredible, fascinating. You see, this is the problem in physics. Oftentimes, if you do theory, you don't even know who's doing experiments. So yeah, okay, we know that everyone in physics knows there's a supermassive black hole in the center. But yet, very few of us actually looked into who discovered that and how did they discover that? You know, I didn't even know these people's names until they announced, I mean, obviously everyone knew Roger Penrose, okay? That's the problem I'm trying to articulate, that everyone knows the theorists, but no one knows who's actually looking at this stuff. It's incredible. I mean, that experiment or that observation, absolutely amazing. Makes me want to do observation, be an astrophysicist and look at a telescope, incredible. Very cool stuff. And for those of you that are literature buffs, uh, the Nobel Prize in Literature was announced. And actually one of my favorite uh, poets won it, which I was so surprised, Louise Glick. No, is that, yeah, Glick, it's not Gluck, it's Glick. That's what she always says. Very incredible poet. You should read her stuff if you ever get a chance. I was very, very happy about that, so. And then for you chemistry nerds, CRISPR won it this year. 
Those of you that know about CRISPR, right? Like the genetic scissors. Wow. Fascinating. Scary and fascinating. How are college applications going? Those of you that are not fun. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. What about, you? wait, Jenna, are you applying to college? I'm a sophomore. Oh my God, okay, <laughs> never mind. I thought you were a senior, that's okay. You have Olha, she's a freshman, so. You two are in the same boat. Huh, okay, you have plenty of time. Rika, how about you with your college applications? It's going. It's going? Yeah. I know. It's, it's, I'm in the same boat as you guys too with grad school applications, so I know how you feel. Okay, one more minute. Okay, what are we gonna do? Oh yeah, now we're gonna plug, the, plug this stuff into the Green's function, our solutions. So that's what we'll do. Okay, so let's continue. So G of R, now has our integrals plugged in. Doing some algebra. I'm going to rewrite this in the following form. And this is our Green's function. Uh, in quantum field theory, these Green's functions are going to be super important because you can imagine, I've just told you that this function defines all the dynamics at a certain point. So in field theory, this Green's function is going to tell me about all the interactions, what's going on with the particles. And in field theory, we'll call these propagators, which you'll see. And it's very, very annoying to compute those, uh, these in field theory, but, but it's actually not, a, not that bad. I'll, I'll rephrase it. It's not that bad. It, as long as you follow a formula. Okay, let's go back to our Helmholtz equation and just plug this stuff in. So I have my Helmholtz equation. plus k squared g naught of r equals zero. Now I have psi of r. Uh, this is recasting all of those, uh, uh, that, that q that I had before. I have to just re-put that in. And of course, as we know, it's from one point to another that you define. I promise you, you're going to get a very simple expression for f of theta. So if you totally are lost, just know what I write down for f of theta. We're getting there. Okay. So let us do our first born approximation. So what is the actually, what am I approximating? So we suppose that V of R naught is localized at, v, at, at R naught equals zero. What do I mean by that? Let's translate. So we have a potential, right? The potential is gonna tell me about the interaction, right? We know that from the Hamiltonian and so on. 
the potential tells me what, what, what the interaction is going to look like. And we assume that the potential is localized. In other words, the potential is localized to one point. Okay. It's, it's, it's at one little point in my coordinate system. Okay. And then we also approximate that psi of R is coming at points far away from the scattering center. Okay. So we assume that R is much greater than R naught. What do I mean by R naught? R naught is my, is my scattering point. Okay. So now I have a bunch of plane waves coming from really far away. Okay. Okay, now I can rewrite this object. Actually, I might have lost a square. No, I'm fine. I can rewrite this in this approximation in the following way. Well, this is not really an approximation. This is actually squaring it out. But here's the approximation. One minus, yeah, one minus two. I don't know why I did that, but it works. Okay, fine. Fine, so I let K be parameterized by R. I don't know. Yeah, this is fine. R minus R not. R, this is just using my uh, exponential rules. And from this, it follows that this fraction in the Born approximation is equal to the following. Okay, wait a second, did I drop, yeah, I dropped an R. That's over R. Okay, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to go a little fast. So, because I, I do wanna finish, I don't wanna leave this little bit hanging. I mean, I've, I've done an approximation. You can work through the algebra, it's not bad. We don't have time right now. But... Okay, can I erase? Okay. I'll describe. Uh, if that's a little confusing, go into Townsend and come to me and let me know what Townsend says, because I haven't looked at Townsend. Okay, and then I can rewrite psi for large r. This is what's really important. Oh, sorry. Okay, remember for scattering, we have an incident wave. Call this a bar this time. Why would I do that? This has to, yeah, this has to be a z then. I don't know why I made it of r. So this is the incident plane wave. And then for large R, just using what I wrote down. Sorry, I need to go fast, but I'm just plugging that back in, what I had before. And when I take into account my radial part and my azimuth, uh, my phi part, I get this. So f of theta and phi is just this thing plugged back in. Okay.
and at low energy, see now this is where the Born approximation comes in. At low energy, the distance between the waves is really large, right? The wavelength is really long. So I can ignore this whole exponential part. So at low energy, I just get this. It's just, the scattering amplitude is just dependent on the potential. Okay. Right, because the exponential is constant because it's really long wavelengths. Okay, and we're almost there. Actually, we are pretty much there. Let me make sure I want to do this. Do I want to go through this? Yeah. This is pretty much it. Well, but let's let's discuss now what we do. Okay, let me break this down. We have a phi dependence. We we want f of theta, right? That's what we want. So I need to ignore. Let me let me discuss this. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to ignore the phi. <laughs> I'll explain why. We'll call this f of theta. This is my scattering amplitude. Okay, this is my scattering amplitude and low energy. Okay, so now given a potential, you can compute a scattering amplitude, right? You can either change this to sines and cosines. You could have a distance between the points. And in the low energy limit, it's only dependent on your V of R. Okay, uh, the phi, don't worry about the phi. We can do some mathematical magic. I wrote down phi, but I'm realizing that, yeah, it's you're just gonna get some random factors out. And as we've seen before, I can rewrite this as a Green's function, right? As we've defined. So this can always be some G of R minus R naught, right? And you're gonna have some complicated uh, contour integral to do. This is it, this is your scattering amplitude. You have some potential that's sourcing the dynamics, okay? And you have a Green's function that's telling you where those dynamics are happening and how specifically they're happening giving a given a potential okay that's it this is your scale and then this is all normalization i love the word normalization that's a big uh i can get away with anything just by saying it's normalization okay so on the homework you get a potential and you compute the scattering amplitude i guide you through it don't worry okay Beautiful. So now let's talk about the Born series. Okay, remember I told you there was a bunch of diagrams that could happen and they're all going to contribute to this. So let's talk about that. That's the final thing for today. And the most important actually conceptually. Uh, don't worry about low energy. No one cares about low energy. <laughs> We're past that. We only care about high energy, more energy. So I just thought I'd show you that. Rutherford actually computed a lot of these f of thetas when he was doing his experiment. There is a process called Rutherford scattering. Okay, so let's say we have a thigh and we want to look at all of the different scatterings. This is, this is the big conceptual takeaway that's going to take us to field theory. 
okay, so one process could just be psi is moving through space. It's doing nothing. Okay, another process that I could add on is that psi hits off of some center, like we've been looking at today, with some impact parameter or with some Green's function, g. I'm going to call them little g here, okay, at the interaction. This is really a Green's function, okay? And here's psi naught coming in, and it hits there, okay. Okay, at some point. Another process could be more confusing. You could have psi coming in, right, and hitting. Uh, let me let me make this hitting it here, and then hitting it here. Okay, so now I have two G's. Uh, yeah, two G's and two B's. Okay, and you could have another process that's even more complicated. Could go here and here and here and here, then come out. The bottom line is all the different processes are going to contribute. All the different processes are going to contribute. Now, nature is nice and simple, right? If I drew two dots on a board and I said, what is the path of least resistance? All of you would say straight line, right? You'd probably not give me something like this unless you were very creative. Okay, and so this is the Born series. All of these diagrams contribute to the process, right? There's, because it's probabilities, so we can't say for sure. But yet one of them is gonna be most likely, and that's if we can compute f of theta, if we can compute the scattering amplitude for that process, then we can kind of ignore everything else. That's what we do. So such a series is called a perturbation series, okay? It's a fancy word. And next week, we're going to do perturbation theory, which is disconnected from this. And all I, all I mean by perturbation series is if I can keep going up a level and keep getting new diagrams and keep expanding all of the different processes that I'm getting. That's all. And when we do the path integral, we're going to condense all of this into one expression. So this is where Feynman gets his idea uh, to compress everything. Again, I'm going to write two more expressions on the board. Okay, so now for this little thing, we have psi of r, right? It's equal to the first thing, psi naught of r, plus an integral of g r minus r naught. I should use capital G for the Green's function. V of R naught, psi of R naught, V of R naught. Okay, so now I've, this is what we've just derived, right, as the scattering amplitude. That's the first order process. In the second order process, you need two Green's functions. Why? There's two interaction points, right? Now there's two places where, then in this, you're going to need four Green's functions. Right, so as I keep going up in the perturbation series, I keep getting more Green's functions. Does that make sense now? More, it's, it's getting less abstract now, right? Hopefully. Okay, and this is what we derive for f of theta. And I will write this out very generally now. Okay, so we have psi equals psi naught plus integral g, I'm just, going to use little g for a reason that will be obvious when we do field theory. V of psi, right? Some potential. And of course, I can obtain a series for psi, right? So now I can obtain a perturbation series. So I can just keep expanding this and expanding this. G V of psi. I'm going to need two Green's function for the next process. G V, G V of psi. Right, and then I'm going to need three, gb, gb, gb of psi, and so on, and so on. Now, obviously, one process is going to be most important. Thank God. Otherwise, how would we compute this? This would be a disaster. We, we couldn't compute. There's an infinite number of diagrams. And this is where Feynman gets his idea for Feynman diagrams. He gets it from the Born series. Okay, and he makes it relativistic. 
by adding things like a propagator, so on and so forth. And so this is where we start to see the idea of first path integral come in to the story. Okay, and uh, I should just uh, recast this in a very general way, right? So it goes all the way to G, V, and sign on. Okay, so literally it goes up to the nth power as I keep adding interactions. Okay, folks. So we are starting to see the seeds of QFT. Okay, we saw Green's functions today. We did contour integrals. We, we did a lot of complicated stuff. So if you're confused, just sit with it, read some more outside stuff, and you'll be okay. Okay, all right. I'm going to turn it over to Gabe, who's going to do a lot of special functions fun today. Right, Gabe? Yes, we are going to do some more genre <laughs> polynomials and spherical harmonics. Now, I figured, you know, you might, everyone should have the experience of computing those, right? At least once in their lives. Yeah, and it's not too complicated. Yeah, it's not. So, okay, great. Okay, thanks, guys. I'm going to read the papers. Uh, those of you that submitted them, you'll get them back today. And uh, there's another, there'll be another problem set that will help you practice this complex analysis. And uh, I give you a potential, a Yukawa potential. You'll find out what that is and you can solve for these scattering amplitudes, okay? All right, great, thanks, Gabe. Um, Kyle, are you gonna be around in like 30 minutes? 30 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I'll stick around. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll leave my, I'll, I'll be sitting at my desk with my camera on. Oh, oh, you have time to chat about the paper a little bit, is that why? Yeah, yeah, just a little bit, so. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, I'll make you both. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. <laughs> Let me, oh, hold up. Let me get this started. Well, first of all, does anybody have any questions on the problem set? Nope. Alrighty then. Well, okay. We can sort of go through them. I actually, I, I did the problem set um, and I don't have the questions on my hand. Actually, let me pull up the questions. This probably a little bit easier. Where is it? Or, hold on. Sorry guys, let me just get this up. One sec. Uh, there you go. Let me open another note. Okay, cool. <laughs> so this week you guys talked a little bit about special functions. So one of those are called the Legendre polynomials. And actually the formula that you guys were given here is the associated Legendre polynomials. Uh, the Legendre polynomials, they're usually denoted by like PL, while the associated the genre polyn polynomials are uh, the, the PLNs that you guys were given in the problem set. Um, and their formula is something like this. So for the associated Legendre polynomials, you're gonna have something like PLN of X. And that's defined as one minus X squared. Oops, the absolute value of M over two. And then the derivative, the mth derivative, derivative, oops, the mth derivative of p l of x. Now, if you don't know what p l of x is, you can't really compute this, but thankfully you do. And these, so this thing here is the associated Legendre polynomial. Yeah. 
polynomial. Okay. And this here is just the Legendre polynomial. And these are also known functions. Uh, and they have this formula, which is PL of X. Uh, is defined as one over two to the L, L factorial, D, the L derivative of X squared minus one to the L. Okay. So a matter of computing each of these functions is really just plugging in a value for L and M into this expression and computing the derivatives. Um, so it's not that complicated. Um, so here, let's do, so to do like problem part A, for example. Um, so we have P for a zero, right? So we have an L value of four and value of zero. So it's going to give us something like one minus X squared zero over two, right? Because we have um, something to the M over two over here. Um, and then derivative the zero derivative, which really is just one uh, times, we set L equals to four and we plug it into this expression. So basically times one, two to the fourth, four factorial, D four, DX four, X squared minus one, four. <clears throat> So now to really compute the this Legendre polynomial is just a matter of simplifying this stuff. So this raised to zero, so that's one. This is also one. And then it's a matter of computing this derivative here, which um, takes a little bit, um, but it's not that bad. And once you do all those things, you're gonna get basically some an expression that kind of looks like this. Mm -hmm. x to the four minus x squared plus 144, okay? And to then, I mean, this is already your associated Legendre polynomial, but it's, it's always nice to simplify it a little bit. And if you do a little bit of algebra, you see that you can simplify this to equal something like this, which is actually what's tabulated. Um, it's also, yeah, I, I hope everyone is aware that it's good to go through these things and like know how they're generated, but all of these are also tabulated. So if you Google on maybe like Wolfram Alpha or, you know, somewhere, um, like the Legendre polynomials, uh, they will give you a list with all of them or a good chunk of them, but I'm pretty sure like you can find <laughs> as many as you want out there in the internet. Um, Anyways, um, for part B, it's kind of a similar procedure. Um, so, but now you actually have an M value. So let's just sketch out how to do that one. Uh, so we have P3 of one, okay. Which is, if you follow one minus X squared. Now we have M equals one. So we have a one over two over here. And we have the first derivative. Maybe Zoom out a little bit. Okay. So we have, yes, so we have the first derivative of this function here, this thing. And we plug in three now into this Legendre polynomial because we have an L equals three value. And then we have over here three derivatives now. So something like, three x squared minus one cubed, okay? And then a the matter of evaluating this <clears throat> is really just, you can take some of these factors to the, to the left, right? Because um, like, for example, this thing is a constant, so you can just shove it to the left. Uh, so you can write something like this. Oops, minus x squared one half. And then really, since you have one derivative here and three derivatives here acting all on this function, you really have four derivatives acting on this function. 
And then you compute all these derivatives and you can simplify a little bit and eventually you arrive at something like this. So squared to be one half. And this is P31. And once again, this is also tabulated. So if you Google on Wolfram Alpha or something like that, um, you'll be able to find these and kind of double check the work that you did. And for part C, it's a, it's a very similar thing. Um, but now we have P32. And, you know, so instead now you plug in two for M. So up in front, you're going to have um, you're going to have, what we call it? you're going to have second two derivatives, right? So like you basically, this is the expression that you should be looking at if I can write it down. It's like squared and now you have two over two. So there's just one. And then you have second derivatives here. So this, and you plug in three for L like we did above. Third derivative is here, x squared minus one cubed. Okay. And similar thing, take this out here. Now you can take this one, this constant up in front, can bring that out here. So you have one, two cube over three factorial, uh, times three factorial. Uh, and basically, what's equivalent to a fifth derivative of minus one cubed? Do some simplifying again, and eventually you get the P32 Legendre polynomial, which is just this actually, which is quite nice. Oops, this thing. Okay, so that's just how to compute these. Um, you know, in in theory, you can plug in any value for, well, not any value, but usually you can plug in. Um, I think usually the condition for these is that. Um, M is less than or equal to absolute value of M. So if you plug in, um, like for example, P40, you can have M values of one, two, three, four. Uh, if you have a P31 or, or a P3 something, you can have M equals uh, zero, one, two, three. You know, it's, as long as the value, the absolute value of M is less than or equal to the value of L. Uh, but yeah, in, in practice, in theory, I guess you can plug in any value for L. Uh, you can make it, you know, absurdly large and you're going to get some really nasty polynomial, but you can, in theory, do it. But once again, uh, let's just make a note of these. If you ever need to look up one of these, uh, they are tabulated. So these are tabulated. Okay. And if you, yeah, if you're ever curious and you need to use one of these, you can just Google something on Wolfram Alpha and it will give you all of these. Um, another special and important class of functions, those are the spherical harmonics, which is question two. And these, they're very important for anything like, uh, well, they're very important to solving the hydrogen atom um, because you have a spherically symmetric potential uh, and to usually describe these, like once you solve the partial differential equation for it, um, to describe these, you usually need these functions, these spherical harmonics. Um, and uh, they also come in handy if you ever do, like if you ever do boundary value problems in electromagnetism um, and you have a spherically symmetric, uh, what do you call it? Um, like a, some spherically symmetric region that you're trying to calculate an electric potential, an electric field or something like that, usually these spherical harmonics come in. Um, so, but anyways, these are given by this relation. So you have YLM and you're given by square root 2L plus one of L minus M factorial over four, Pi L plus M <clears throat> e to the I and phi, just a phaser. And now this is a this is the Lagrange associated Lagrange polynomials that we calculated above. But 
um, instead of plugging in X as your argument, you plug in cosine of theta. So that's kind of the catch. So let's say like the P32 of um, cosine of theta, it would be like 15 cosine of theta uh, times one minus cosine of theta squared. Um, so you just plug in um, cosine of theta in the place for X. And we have a condition for these, if I remember it correctly, is that Y L minus M equals uh, minus one to the M Y L M with a positive M, the complex conjugate. So you also have this condition, um, which allows you to calculate the spherical harmonics with um, if you have a negative M value. And the similar condition here is that absolute value of M is less than or equal to L. So you can't, you can't really have, uh, if you have like, you can't have a Y three for M and two for L because M is greater than L. Um, and you have this relation here. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, to compute these, it's not much harder than what we did above. Um, and here's where actually using the tabulated associated Legendre polynomials come in handy, uh, just so you don't have to keep computing these over and over again. But so were you to do it, let's say if you were to calculate y three zero, which is part eight, um, up in front, I believe you're gonna get a minus one. Um, and you're gonna get something like this, which is three factorial up inside four pi, three factorial. And it's just a matter of plugging into this mess in the formula. Uh, these two things are equal, so you can cancel them out, which is good and handy. Um, we, in theory, have an e to the i m phi, but m here is zero, so we have just one. And then we're also going to have the p three zero cosine of theta. Okay. Um, so you, once again, you could go ahead and compute these like we did above, but usually it's, you can just look them up to, to save yourself some time. Um, and it turns out, I believe that P three zero of X is something like one half X um, times five X squared minus three, something like this, I think. And then if you plug in the cosines, since we're doing P three zero of cosine of theta, this uh, becomes cosine theta, five cosine squared of theta minus three. Okay. Um, and then to kind of sum it all up, really y three zero, oops, y three zero equals this thing. Four pi. Um, yes, times one half cosine of theta, five cosine squared of theta minus three. So that's why three zero. Okay. Wait, why is it negative? Oh, did I? Mm. Oh, you're right. I just got a minus sign wrong. <laughs> Oops. Good catch. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's part A. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I just got a minus sign wrong. Thanks. That's a good catch. Um, okay. Uh, for Y31 and the other ones, it's a very similar procedure. Um, here we can sketch out, hold up. We can sketch out how those are gonna look like as well. Okay, so let's do it. Okay, so I31, I think is the next one that we have to do. And um, so I'm gonna just, uh, this thing, we have seven, four, five, and yeah, let me, let me be a little bit clear here. So we're getting seven because um, we have three. So we have two, three, L plus one, that's seven, four pi on the bottom. Um, here we had L equals three, M equals zero. So we just have three factorial over three factorial. 
here though we have uh, L equals one. So actually we're going to get something like two factorial up on top and four factorial on the bottom. Okay. Um, because we have <clears throat> L minus L minus M factorial. Um, so that's three minus one, two factorial. L plus M, two, um, three plus one, four factorial. Okay. And this is E to the phi because we have E to the I M phi and here's one. So we just have E to the phi. Uh, and we're gonna have this associated Legendre polynomial which is P three one cosine theta. Okay. Um, and this Legendre polynomial with the cosine, I believe you can write it once again, if you just look it up, is one minus five cosine squared of theta. One minus cosine, something like that. Okay, and once again, yeah, you can just look this, this thing up. And then if you do some simplifying, once again, um, simplify what, whatever's under the square root and et cetera, et cetera, um, you should arrive that y31 looks something like this. Um, I'm taking out a minus sign from over here so I can, I'm just like flipping this thing so that it looks like what's, tabula like what's usually tabulated. Okay, 21, five. Hey, I'm gonna get a sine of theta <clears throat> because one minus cosine of theta, this is sine squared of theta. Take the square root, so just sine of theta. So you're gonna get a sine of theta. Oh, shoot. That keeps happening. Five cosine squared of theta minus one. And we're gonna need to be I phi. So that's Y31. Um, Okay, dokie. Okay. Um, for part C, I think there was a typo, right? Maybe because because um, it was what like it was y three factor or something like that, right? Um, I think this is a typo, so I'm not sure what actually Kyle wanted us to compute. Um, so I'm gonna. Right. Type up maybe question. Um. Oh shoot! I just saw that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no wait. It's an exclamation point. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay, treat it as a one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it's no worries. Um, oh my lord. Are you sure you meant it as a one? Because a second, let me see the problem. It's just supposed to be, but like. This would have to be a number greater than three. Right, right. No, no, never mind. Never mind. Yeah. Mind. So we we'll just you could the solution to this one is typo. Yeah, it's that one. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, <laughs> also, there was another typo. Uh, question three is written as question one, but that's not a that's not a big one. <laughs> so the yeah, if we move on to question three, and this is actually the interesting one. Uh, yeah. This is a good one. Yeah, so are we an electron? Um, what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> it, might be, it might sound kind of surprising, but no, we're not. Uh, here. So the, the way to do this, part of the problem is, well, first of all, part A tells you what what is the potential right so and since we're an earth sun system and the potential that governs the laws of motion around the sun is gravity uh, gravitational potential uh the potential for the earth system is really just it's this thing which is the gravitational potential m here's the mass of the sun big m little m is the mass of earth um so I'll try to write them clearly enough, although my handwriting is not the best. Um, so that's the potential that we got to deal with. B. Uh, oops. Oh, that keeps happening. Um, okay. So B, to calculate B, first you just know that the Bohr radius is given by this expression, just H bar. Mu here is the reduced mass, C alpha. Alpha is a fine structure constant which depending on the units that you're using, 
it's an arcade is going to be given by something like this, I think. Um, H -bar C. Okay. Um, so if you plug this in here, so you can get a little bit of a clear expression for what you're trying to do, we'll find that A naught equals so we plug in, so you get four pi F naught H bar C. Oops. We got an H bar squared because we got an H bar on the bottom, it moves up on top. Uh, we also got a C in the bottom moves up on top as long as the, with the four pi. Um, and then we're going to get mu C and then E squared. We can do some canceling out, which is very nice. We cancel these C's and we eventually arrive at So the bore radius that we're dealing with here is four pi. Oops, not H bar squared. Mu. Okay. So maybe that still hasn't gotten us very far, but the thing to keep in mind now is that you have an electric potential when you're dealing with something like the hydrogen atom that looks something like this. And you squared over the arm, right? And when you're dealing with something that's gravitational, you're gonna get something that looks like this. Um, oh, oops, minus. Um, which is exactly what we got above mm over r, right? And really what you can do is you can, since these things are very similar, you can kind of look by analogy, right? So <clears throat> in this case here, we have oh, some constant <clears throat> and here we have another constant. And over here we have some scaling, right? Uh, which determines the strength of our potential, which in here are the charges and over here are the masses. So really what you can do, you can kind of look at this by analogy and say, well, one over four pi epsilon naught goes to Newton's constant and the E squared goes to MM, okay? <clears throat> now the reduced mass of the system, because we also need that to um, eventually compute the Bohr radius. The, the, the reduced mass of the Earth's sun system is given by uh, M, M, M plus M. I hope it's clear which M is the big one, which M is the small one. Um, but so what you do now is you take these things and kind of by analogy and you just substitute it into this expression, which um, is usually given for like a hydrogen atom. So everywhere you see a, a, here you have technically like one over four pi epsilon naught to the minus one. So what you can plug into this expression is g to the minus one. Um, you, here you have e squared and here by analogy, we said that e squared goes to m, the big M, little m. So you plug that in. Um, so I guess to make this more clear, you could write this as, uh, what do I have an h bar squared? Mu e squared. And this thing using all of those little things that we found is going to be, um, an h bar squared g and m and then times the reduced mass which i'm just going to flip over because we have it in the denominator so we're going to have big uh, doesn't look like a good big m uh, big uh, what the hell? big m little m over big m little m okay now we can do some simplifying in this actually um not completely necessary, but it doesn't hurt. Um, so if you separate those two expressions, so we have h bar squared, m big M, g m squared, little m squared, plus h bar squared, little m, g m squared, m squared. Now, I guess the thing to keep in mind is that um, this mass here, this is the mass of the Earth, mass of Earth. This is the mass of the Sun, squared, this is also the mass of the earth squared. And we have h bar squared here, which is like minuscule up on top. Uh, so this thing is very, very small compared to this thing in like orders of magnitude. Um, so we can just do the good old set it to zero. Okay. And so basically what you get is that the Bohr radius for this system is this. Uh, we can actually cancel some of the, can cancel the m on top with one of the m on the bottom, g. M, M squared, okay. That's, that's the radius for the system. And now if we were to plug in some numbers to kind of get a, a guesstimate of um, how big this thing is, 
So h bar squared, uh, if people know, that's 1.05 times 10 to the negative 34. Uh, Newton's constant, I forget the exact constant, but it's something like 10 to the negative 11. Uh, mass of the sun is 10 to the 30th. Uh, and mass of the earth is to the 10 to the 24, maybe, I think. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, you plug in some numbers in here, which you, once again, can use the power of Google. And you get that this thing is around 10 to the minus 140 about, um, which is really small and very not what we see out there. So no, we are not an electron. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting to do these things and say like, well, let me apply what I learned from quantum mechanics uh, into a system um, like a gravitational system. And usually kind of what happens is that the gravitational force is very weak compared to the electromagnetic force. Um, and that's kind of reflected on why this radius would be really small too, so. But anyways, yeah, so that's kind of the, that's the problem set, I guess. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Oh, also one note, I wanted to refer to this. I think this was, I got a question about this on from, it was from the last problem set. And somebody asked me like, why doesn't the Lorentz boost um, keep the identity matrix or like preserves the Euclidean metric? And you're right, it doesn't because um, the, the Lorentz boost they're defined to preserve the um, like the, what we call the, the Minkowski metric, which uh, is actually what we use in like general relativity. Um, to describe space time and what the metric is I'm like I'm just throwing jargon around there you guys but what the metric is it's really something that it quantifies distances in space um, and it's like kind of a measure hence the metric of like how you define a distance over your space right so in Euclidean space the distance like maybe I can write this down to make it a little bit more clear um, so in the Euclidean space, a distance like ds is given by the Pythagorean theorem. So if you're doing things in like two dimensions, uh, this would be something like this, plus dy squared, right? Because that's just the Pythagorean theorem, that's the distance. Uh, if we square these things, so you have d squared, dx squared plus dy squared, you can actually represent this relation by some matrix. If you do like, can write this one. Favorite, you're, you're deriving everyone's favorite equation in GR. <laughs> yeah. Ds squared equals eta mu nu dx mu dx mu. Yeah. So like you could write this maybe even as some type of vector here, right? Yeah. And like if you do this thing, you're going to get back this equation. Um, and this is in Euclidean space, um, which is well, I guess here's two dimensional space, but it's all flat, everything. This mat is reflected on this metric, right? Um, that's why like in Euclidean space, you really, you kind of have an identity matrix. Um, so I don't know if I'm making any sense at all, by the way, so please stop me. Um, and, but when you're talking about general relativity or special relativity even, um, this thing, what your sense of distance is not the same in Euclidean space because you're dealing, um, with space time, which is this four dimensional space that merges time and space together. Uh, and to deal with that, you, we usually have a minus sign difference between the spatial terms, so X, Y, and Z, and the time term, uh, and as a, like a form of how we calculate distances um, on space time. Uh, so when we're dealing with space time, the metric actually looks something like this. And now we're here, I did 2D, but now we're upgrading this to four dimensions, which is kind of a jump. Uh, but usually the metric, uh, and this is kind of by convention, um, I'm going to put minus sign over here. Uh, Except particle physicists usually do it the other way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and GR, uh, Rosen always puts it here, so it's gotten yeah. to the habit now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but it's such a pain in the ass when the signature is backwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here we're going to, oops, I almost made a mistake. I'm just 
this is dx squared dy squared dz squared okay so this is this thing here is the metric in space time whenever you talk about special relativity this gives you distance it gives distance and well it's not too relevant in special relativity but in special relativity and more importantly in general relativity okay um can i spell relativity relativity yeah um and usually this is written short g mu nu x mu something like that and t uh oops there you go oh that's really crappy indexes and i apologize um, we will be, which we will be learning this in, in our uh, special relativity matinee before we do QFT. <laughs> so this is a good preview. Yeah, and this is all to say that the same transformation, so like your sense of distance when you go from Euclidean space to space time, it's different, right? So certain transformations that you can do in the Euclidean space uh, that preserve your notion of distance um, and hence kind of preserve some of the properties of your space, you cannot do in space time, right? Or kind of vice versa. But usually what's defined is the, the operation that preserves this quantity. So it preserves your notion of distance in space time. Those are the Lorentz transformations, which is noted by um, this big um, lambda. Did you do that calculation, Gabe, where you do lambda transpose eta lambda gives back the metric? Yeah. Yeah, so that's like the whole, that's like the big way to show that these leave the metric invariant. Yeah, exactly. So like what Kyle is saying is if you write this thing over here, this is the metric um, better by G here, this should equal one. Right. To leave the metric invariant. So, uh, yeah. So I think on the on the last problem set, I don't know if this was a type as well, maybe. But I think I wrote something like this, which was. Um, I, it was. I. Uh, I yeah. wrote. Yeah. Yeah. So and I think somebody asked me about it on that have been the email. Eta. That should have been an eta, not a one. Yeah. yeah. So. Eta, by the way, yeah, eta is what usually, you, like G, we usually used to denote some arbitrary metric. Eta, we used to denote uh, the Minkowski metric, which is this thing here. So maybe I should have written, so this thing here is eta, mu, mu, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, yeah, so like somebody asked me about this on like through email and I, I forgot to respond that point. <laughs> uh, but they asked like, oh, they were trying to compute this thing and it wasn't working. And no, I was like, yeah, it shouldn't work. Uh, good, good. Yeah. So, um, because yeah, what should actually be conserved here is the four dimensional space-time metric, also known as the Minkowski metric. So just a little note from last, last problem set. Yeah, that minus sign will ruin you <laughs> in that, in the yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, at least then you discover what, I mean, that's, that's a good discovery that the, to see that that bottom expression does not work. Yeah. And actually, uh, there you go. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, and of it's course, funny yeah. because I actually am working on a piece about this. Uh, it's called general relativity for high schoolers. And the first mm -hmm. sentence is, the, the one of the some of the basic concepts in GR can literally come from the distance formula because literally I yeah. mean so much of it comes from the distance formula yeah it's kind of impressive like yeah. a lot of the properties that you you derive in GR it's all starting from this expression right exactly. although of course like as you change it and here's the so here's the kicker right of like this thing describes flat space time mm -hmm. um which is why like special relativity is really kind of a study of flat space time. Um, and please stop me if I'm like throwing jargon around or saying space time, flat space time, metric <laughs> and all this type of stuff. Uh, but yeah, so like this thing describes special relativity pretty much the distances that you deal with flat, flat, flat space time. 
And maybe you guys have heard about this, but general relativity usually studies curved spacetime and curvature. So the way that you actually denote curvature is you change this metric because now you think about it like this. If you have, like you have your desk or whatever you're sitting and uh, you can draw triangles and you can draw whatever shapes in there and you have some idea of distance because this thing is flat. But now picture if you have like the globe, right? Uh, like you have one of those like miniature globes that you look around. Um, and usually if like, if you were to try to draw some type of triangle in there or whatever, like some of those distances are going to be altered because now you're talking about a curved surface, not just a flat surface. And the way that that's denoted, that change in distance uh, over when you're dealing in this curved surface and on the globe or more generally any other curved surface, uh, rather than something that's flat like your desk, is um, you change the metric because you have some change, you have a different idea of distance now. And, and, um, and a good way to look at that in the context is, we did spherical coordinates last time, Gabe, for the hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. And obviously we, we had to write down our differentials or our basis in spherical coordinates. So now you can imagine in the example Gabe gave where there's a globe, you might wanna use spherical coordinates. Well, yeah. then your differentials are going to be different, right? Your basis is going to be different. Therefore, your metric, G and your new, will be different. Now you'll yeah. have spherical components in the metric, right? And dr, instead of dt, dx, dy, dz, you'll have dt, dr, d theta, d phi, right? So that's how your metric can change to reflect that curvature or reflect a change in basis from one basis to another basis. Exactly. And, like, and so this is why this sense of distance is so crucial in gr, because it's really how you you define like because if you if you want to compute anything like if you want to compute a particle trajectory you need to have some sense of distance right and if you're doing that on a curved space time you need to change your metric because your sense of different distance is now different um, than what you started with in something that is flat even in going from like and this is already kind of trippy like even in going from uh, Euclidean space to space time, your sense of distance is already different, right? Because if you were just uh, doing Euclidean space, your distance in four dimensions would be uh, some like, if you write it, if we had like a, a coordinate W, you could have dx squared plus dy squared plus dc squared plus dw squared. But that's not what we see in space time right now. Like that first coordinate has a minus sign in front of it. And that kind of describes some of the interplay between time and space. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like crucial to all the properties that you derive in general relativity mm -hmm. and even in special relativity that um, you need to have this minus sign in front of uh, in the metric. And um, I guess the last little bit too on spherical coordinates uh, like Kyle was talking about. It's also important that, and I think this is going to, if you guys ever do special relativity, this is important later. Um, coordinates itself, they don't change the your space right so you can have flat space it's like picture if you guys ever did polar coordinates in high school um right like it, you're still describing two-dimensional space is just with different variables now uh but it's still flat space uh if you do the same thing in three dimensions you can use uh, spherical coordinates but you're still describing three-dimensional euclidean space uh so when we change the metric uh it's like, I, I guess, yeah, it's like, you're not only changing the coordinates, you're changing space itself. You're changing what you're describing. So that's just something to keep in mind. But I also don't know, I don't like, this is verging towards general relativity, which I don't think we're gonna touch too much other than like, here's the metric and kind of moving on from this. Great. But yeah. So. Are there any questions on this or anything that we did above? No. Everything is clear. Everybody understands everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we, we can put GR on the next problem set then, Kyle. Good. Let's do let's do a wormhole metric and get yeah. equations in motion. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's have him derive the geodesic equation. Oh my God, what a pain in the ass. Except it's, it's almost like just deriving the Euler-Lagrange equations, right? Yeah. Yeah, except it's, it's just perfect. like the, the indices are very hard to keep. Yeah, up. yeah, it's, just the it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's another one of those derivations that you must at least do once if you're gonna be a physics student. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, if people don't have any questions, I think we're good for today. Um, I think yeah, you guys have another problem set uh, next week. Yeah. Which is gonna have some counter integrals. Yes. Some residues. Yeah. <laughs> crackers are residues. <laughs> All right. So if nobody has anything. You guys are free from this painful experience of watching me do weird math for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. I didn't realize it was still recording. So Gabe, you might want to stop that. Oh. Oh crap. I'll oh. just I'll leave it in there. Who cares? Yeah, hold on. Recording. Oh, there it is. Pause.